Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz, Vice President for External Relations here at CSIS, and I'm uh, proud to welcome you here today. Uh, I know this is a busy news day, so we'll, uh, to say the least, so we'll get through this briefing pretty quick. And um, regarding economics, um, Fairbors Gadar has to leave a little bit early today, so please excuse us for that. But if any questions go unanswered, you can always contact me at hschwartz at csis.org um, or give us a call. Um, you also, we also have in front of, uh, you should also have in front of you an article uh, by Andrew Cutchins, who's our Russia program director, um, that's sort of teeing up uh, uh, pre uh, President Medvedev's visit here uh, later in the week. Um, Andy wrote this while he was uh, in Moscow, where, it's, where he is now, but we could, you could also reach him later this week if you're seeking comment. Um, we're going to talk about the G8 and the G20. You also should have uh, an edition of our Critical Question series uh, by Heather Conley and Stephen Morrison. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Heather Conley, who's a senior fellow and director of our Europe program, who's just going to set up the tone for this trip. And with that, I'll give it to Heather. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you all for, uh, for coming. I have to say my point of reference every time I uh, begin to look at analysis of the G8, I always begin with the family photo uh, from last year, and I see, well, what has changed? Uh, who's, uh, we have new faces and, and perhaps more stress lines on the faces that are still there. Obviously, uh, this year uh, for, the, uh, for the G8 meeting in Huntsville, uh, Ontario, we have two new faces, the uh, new British Prime Minister David Cameron and the Japanese Prime Minister, and I'll let Charles talk a bit about, uh, about uh, the, the Japanese uh, contribution. But let me, if I may, just very briefly touch on the, each of the leaders that will be uh, convening at the G8 summit and sort of their approach uh, both to the substance of the agenda as well as where they're coming from politically. Um, I think the, the, probably the person who has the most stress lines on her face is Chancellor Angela Merkel. Um, she's uh, growing under uh, great stress domestically. Uh, her coalition is, uh, has been very challenged uh, by a series of domestic, uh, d domestic issues and obviously the great unpopularity of, of the bailout uh, for, for Greece. But she's also under great stress within the EU, quite frankly, uh, assuming that the Germany is not playing its true traditional role within the EU, and some are, uh, some are very uh, anxiety-ridden about that. And she will be under pressure. Uh, today she gave uh, some uh, outreach to the, to the press suggesting that, no, Germany will not be singled out at the G8, and I think that's uh, an interesting uh, point of clarification. She does know she's under stress. Last year, Prime Minister Berlusconi of Italy provided some very scintillating headlines prior to the G8 summit uh, in Italy. I think he's taken a much quieter uh, approach, uh, trying to stay out of the crosshairs of the market potentially and start doing some difficult austerity measures. Um, but I, I think Italy, and Lisa will likely touch on this, is certainly probably the most uh, significant underperformer as far as fulfilling its uh, development aid uh, pledges. And I think that will come out and has come out in the report card that has been issued. Uh, in, in France, it's not just about the World Cup, although that's been a great uh, focus. Uh, President Sarkozy has been working very hard to try to improve his uh, diminishing opinion polls. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the ban on the burqa, working through the National Assembly, and, and uh, his own efforts to take the economic helm and be the leader within the EU for an EU-led solution. Um, it's important to note that next year, France uh, ho will be the chair of both the G8 and the G20. So I think you'll see President Sarkozy working towards uh, 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 his, his own chairmanship in that agenda. Obviously for Russia, President Medvedev uh, will be coming off his visit to Silicon Valley and his bilateral with, uh, with President Obama. Uh, he will certainly be talking about the economy. Uh, he had a conversation the other day with uh, French President Sarkozy uh, mentioning that uh, it would be a great idea if we could enlarge the basket of international currencies, not just focus so much on the, on the dollar. Uh, so you may see some, some dynamism there uh, from uh, President Medvedev. Obviously, uh, Prime Minister Cameron, his first uh, appearance uh, at the G8 summit. Um, it, he'll be at his first face-to-face -face with President Obama. It will be the precursor to an Oval Office meeting 
that Prime Minister Cameron will have with the, the President uh, next month. Obviously, there'll be lots of cameras pointed on that first uh, encounter uh, in light of the, the Gulf oil spill. Um, uh, Mr. Cameron is consumed by his own domestic uh, situation and trying to uh, uh, implement some, some significant, significant austerity measures. And obviously, Afghanistan, and this is where some of the conversation about the, uh, the recent news uh, regarding General McChrystal, we, uh, the UK just uh, today uh, had its 301st death in Afghanistan. Uh, this is going to be a, a continuing issue. Cameron was in Kabul very recently uh, trying to ensure uh, robust British uh, presence there, but this will be an ongoing issue. And last but not least, Canada. Uh, Prime Minister Har Harper is the host who, for the first time, is trying to pull off back-to-back -back G8 and G20 meetings. He's done a, a very good job of trying to make sure those agendas are uh, not overlapping, that they work together. He's under some political pressure himself for the cost of the security of both the G8 and the G20 uh, is over a billion, more than the security for the Olympics in February. He's also under pressure uh, for creating a fake lake and uh, some of the atmospherics and the bucolic setting that uh, becomes the G8. Uh, but he will be credited for creating, and again, Lisa will uh, touch on this, uh, a, a major maternal and child health care initiative that, that will be the G8 signature initiative coming out of this meeting. So that gives you a sense of how everyone comes to the dance, uh, uh, as it were, for the G8. And really, on the, on the economic agenda, and this is just a precursor to uh, what will be discussed, there is more that divides uh, the United States and Europe on the economic agenda uh, than unites it. There's certainly unity on the security uh, agenda and the political agenda, but there's actually great disunity on the economic agenda. And I'll just give you a very few uh, examples. Um, the Europeans would like very much to create a global bank levy to pay for future bank uh, crises and bailouts. That's a no-go uh, for the US, Canada, and Japan. Europe is in the mood for austerity and fiscal consolidation, understandably for its uh, debt crisis. Uh, in fact, the Germans have uh, sort of created a preemptive austerity plan, um, and that is causing some, some uh, discord uh, because it, to coordinate how countries exit their stimulus packages will be very important. And in yesterday's call between President Obama and Chancellor Merkel, you started hearing the word, well, we have to differentiate our exit strategies, which means I think they're having a challenging time coming to an agreement on how and when you begin uh, to, to end stimulus and start moving to, to greater fiscal consolidation. The Europeans very much have a focus on blaming the market for some of, of deepening uh, the European debt crisis, and they're, they're very focused on trying to prevent market speculation. So you're seeing where uh, Germany and others are focusing on eliminating those elements, naked short selling. Uh, they're trying to tighten control over, der over derivative and hedge fund activity. They see the market making this worse, and the, the governments are losing the ability to, to affect uh, where they'd like to, to see the outcome. Um, obviously, the stress test, the fact that Europe has now agreed to do some banking stress tests is a, is, a, is a victory, seen as a victory. Questions remain on the rigor of these stress tests. Questions also remain on how transparent they will be, and there's some concern in Europe that if actually we see how bad the, these banks are, that it may actually cause uh, uh, increased uh, market concerns. So a whole bunch of issues. There won't be great, uh, there'll be great conversation at the G8 uh, as a lead up to the G20 economic conversation, but I'm not sure you're going to see much, uh, much uh, uh, cohesiveness uh, transatlantically on the economic agenda. And then finally, we do this annually. We say, wither the G8. Uh, why do we have this meeting? Uh, the G8 isn't withering quite yet. Uh, it still has a robust role in security, uh, development assistance, um, in addition to uh, consolidating uh, the economic uh, part of the agenda. I mean, if you recall, in seven, 1975, the G5 was created to talk about uh, the economic crisis of the oil shock. 
uh, and it grew and grew into a, a broader agenda which dealt with security, development, assistance. It's not inconceivable with the G20 at some point, uh, you'll see agenda items begin to migrate from the G8 to the G20. And in fact, the South Koreans who will host the, the G20 summit, at the next G20 summit in November, have suggested that maybe the G20 should start talking about development. This will be a, a fluid period, a transitional period. The G20 has to want these agenda items and they're gonna have to create mechanisms to address it. But for now, the G8 will continue to play an important role uh, in some of these uh, broader agenda topics. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised uh, over time, uh, you may see the G20 accepting more of these larger, uh, complex uh, global challenges uh, towards uh, in the G G20 framework. Thank you. Yes, Heather, thank you for that. That was a terrific uh, uh, overview. Um, we're now going to go to my colleague, uh, our colleague, Fairbourse Gadar, who is a distinguished scholar and senior advisor here at CSIS. Um, you have FG, as we call him affectionately, uh, bio in front of you, but he really is one of the leading authorities on future business trends, global economics, and international finance and banking. And I'm going to let him uh, tell you about how this plays into the G8. Okay. Or G20. Thank you very much, Andrew, uh, and thank you, Heather, for such a wonderful start. Uh, I'll try to expand a little bit on what Heather was talking about. And last time when they met, um, both the G8 and the G20, there was qu quite a bit of consensus. The economy of the world was in trouble, and they all had to do something, and they were going to stimulate it, and uh, so there was uh, much more consensus than it is this time. Uh, this time, we really have three meetings, not two. I think we have the G8, the G20, and the street. And the street's going to be very important this time because the G8 and the G20 will disagree with what the street wants. And you may, in fact, see the street be uh, quite a significant uh, player in the, in the coming week. Uh, let me look at uh, first on what are the key issues that are economic <coughs> and global. And if you look at the key issues, the first one is uh, financial regulatory reform. Uh, particularly regarding the development of more conservative capital requirements that Heather mentioned and more stringent regulations on liquidity. This is going to be a big deal, and it's not going to be cons – there's no consensus on that, and you're going to see discussions on how to handle it, and Heather mentioned about the tax levy. I'll mention that a little bit later on as well. The second one is how do we come up with sustained and balanced economic growth to deal with the persistent deficit of some countries and the persistent surpluses of the others. Read into that the U.S. and China, okay? And, and finally, uh, sort of all-encompassing is you know, what are we going to do and what about the level of deficits that these countries are generating? And that came into effect uh, right front and center with the Greek and the Euro crisis. And that's emblematic of what sustained deficit can produce. So you've got three major issues of which there is really no consensus among many of the groups in the, in the G8 and the G20. So now we could sort of pare it down and go down into G8. Uh, the G8, I call them as the check writers of the world, okay? They are the most affluent and they're writing the checks. They're writing the checks for development, so they're worried about you know, things such as AIDS, malaria, child care, et cetera. Um, and I think Lisa is going to talk a little bit more about that. But they also are worried about the concerns of the developed world, which would be nonproliferation, terrorism, and security. So on those, they can all sort of agree with each other. There's a question of whether they met their commitments in the past, or are they just committing and not delivering, et cetera. But that, that's sort of the, the area in which the G8 feels very comfortable. As soon as you go into the three economic issues, however, that we talked about, they can't really deal with it without the G20. Okay. And each one of them looks at the G20 issues and wants to handle it in a different way. So if you look at, for example, the issue of uh, the deficit of the Greek and the Euros and the implication of the deficit, um, as Heather mentioned, the Europeans want to have a bank tax levy. Okay. Transaction levies, constraint on the capital movement, uh, that doesn't sit very well with countries that don't have a bank problem. So read into that Brazil, China, India, 
even, I would say, Japan, uh, Canada, and maybe even Russia. So there's going to be some disagreement on that. And the U.S. has basically said, look, I gave the money and the, uh, the Trump money is coming back. So I think that's not going to go anywhere. So I agree with Heather's assessment. I think the whole issue of the tax levy is an interesting thing that the Europeans want to do, but it's not going to have any kind of track uh, with the G20. Uh, and in fact, we saw some, some indication of that in June 4 or 5 in Korea, where in Busan they basically <coughs> didn't, have any didn't have any take. However, the Europeans will say, look, we've done some stuff. We've done the stress tests. Yes, they did the stress tests, but they didn't divulge it. Took them a while before they divulged it. And now that they've divulged it, it's not clear whether the stress test was really stressful. <laughs> okay. um, there was some issue when the US did the stress test that the stress test was not that stressful. Well, in Europe, it's much less stressful. And the question is, how transparent is it? Does it make sense? So yes, they've done this stress test, and they want to come up with a resolution. Remember, the banks have bought, uh, many of the European banks have bought the papers of Spain, Italy, and more Greece. Um, those papers may be worthless. If it's worthless and it all comes out, then who's going to bail it out? If the governments don't want to bail it out, then they're going to tax them. This is just not going to sit very well. So this is a major issue with Europe, even though they come to the table and say, look, we've done the stress test. U.S. comes to the table and basically says, look, I've got an economy that's improving. I did the stress test. It was a pretty good stress test. Uh, my legislative branch is trying to come up with financial regulations, and the Trump money is coming back. So Obama goes there actually looking pretty good, except that we've got the largest deficit of any country around the world. And maybe not as a percentage, but certainly an absolute amount it's a huge deficit. And we are the ones who buy everything, and the Chinese are the ones that sell everything. The Chinese, the Brazilians, and the Indians come to the table in much better shape. But the main issue was going to be the China foreign exchange rate. Uh, the Chinese sort of made some kind of gesture that they're going to consider changing the valuation. They're going to try to change it. Um, the markets got very excited about it. The stock market went up. European stock markets went up. Um, and then we sort of sat back and said, well, this is what they've been telling us all along. <laughs> so what's new? Um, now, to be fair to the Chinese, the, the currency has actually appreciated. So if you look at it, I remember four or five years ago, it was 7.5. I was there recently at 6.75. So that's really a significant appreciation. However, the feeling is that's not good enough, and we really need some more. And yes, it's nice that you're telling us that, but you know, when are you going to do it? But by their gesture, um, the emphasis on the G20 that was going to be on the currency of the Chinese has basically somewhat dissipated, although I think it's going to come back again. The G20 is also going to talk about development. Some of these countries are now beginning to be rich. Some of them are going to start writing checks. To the extent that they're going to write checks, they want to have a say. <coughs> One of the issues that sort of hasn't been talked about but periodically comes about is what about if I'm writing all the checks, why don't I have a say on the global financial and economic situation? What's their position going to be at the IMF? If they're going to be the big buyers of U.S. Treasury, if they're going to be giving a lot of money to International Monetary Board Fund, why can't they have more of a say on how things are done at the IMF and the World Bank, which is right down the road? Finally, uh, I'd like to talk about the street. Um, Heather talked about the billion Canadian dollars that's being spent on security. Some of it is going to the lake, some of it on construction that may not even finish. Uh, they're trying to put a very good um, face. Um, some people say because of internal you know, politics in, in Canada. But a billion dollars is still a billion dollars. Okay? That's a lot of money. So why are they doing that? 
I suspect that the street is looking at this and saying, you guys have failed. Okay. The G20 is supposed to be the board of directors of the global economy. The G20, according to the street, has failed. Now, the G20 looks at it and says, look, if I'm going to be benevolent and look about the social issues, et cetera, I'm going to dilute my impact. So I should really be the board of directors of the global economy. The street, however, says, look, you're missing on some key issues. Key issues are if you restrict the budget, if you want to restrict the budget deficits, you're going to have to cut off a lot of benefits. What's going to happen to the labor movement? I think we're going to see some labor demonstrations in Canada. Now, the U.S. steel workers are going to be there. But other people are going to be there. So uh, the street's going to say, you've talked about environmental issues, but what are you doing about it? Okay. Yes, you're going to talk about the oil spill in the Gulf, but what about global warming? A billion dollars, I think, is because they're quite concerned the street's going to be very vocal. And, this, and the proof of the pudding is I read an article that they're going to have some sound cannons coming up. Now, I didn't know the Canadians believed in sound cannons. So if you're not familiar with sound cannons, these are machines that make, that make very, very loud noise. And up to 300 yards is practically, you know, first um, your ears. But that's part of the crowd control. Why do they need sound cannons? I believe that there's concern that the street's going to be quite vocal. And I believe that the street's going to say, look, you're relying on the three issues, the three issues that we talked about, the deficit, the financial regulatory reform, and the sustained economic growth, U.S. deficit, China surplus, but you've forgotten about the concerns of society. And that's going to be a big issue. And G20 rightly will say, look, my role is the board of directors of the economy of the world. The street's going to say, well, what about social issues that are related to the world? And that's going to be one of the sort of secondary issues that we're going to see in Toronto. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Um, well, thank you, Fair Voice. Uh, Charles Freeman, my colleague who is our China Studies Chair and former US Assistant USTR for China Affairs in the Bush Administration. Charles. Um, thanks, Andrew, and thanks, Heather, and Fair Voice. You've covered a lot of ground. I'm, I'm, I guess my role is here is, is um, to add the China dimension, which seems to be present in everything that, that we do. Um, so uh, I will do that. I won't try to get, I won't as, as Heather suggested, talk too much about Japan's role in G8, other than to say the interesting thing there is to watch uh, the, the body language between President Obama and Prime Minister Naoto Kan as this is the, there's, there is some speculation both here in Japan that the, the U.S. administration was too heavy-handed in bringing down uh, uh, the former Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama, and uh, there is some concern that, that uh, U.S. and President Obama will be unpopular in Japan, so there's a, a question of how uh, that the, the, the two uh, leaders relate. Um, but China, uh, China's role in G20, which is, I think, the, the interesting thing that, that, uh, that FG talked about and which, which I think a lot of people are, are, are focused on. Um, China's role in, these, uh, in, in these, these meetings, in the G20 meeting in particular, is, is still evolving. I don't think there's any consensus in China let alone anywhere else, uh, that the G20 is sort of the new, not only board of directors of the, of the world, world economy, but is also a, the new effective board of directors for other issues, whether they be social issues that, issue, uh, that FG talked about or, or um, climate change or anything else. In fact, China has been pretty vociferous that those issues be kept off the agenda because uh, China has some defensive concerns there and, and doesn't want another opportunity to be knocked about head and shoulders on, on those issues. China approaches these meetings very much with its own interests in mind. It's not yet at the point where it, it is prepared to cloak itself in the mantle of global leadership and, and take charge 
uh, at the G20 or elsewhere or at the UN or, or elsewhere. It's very much focused on its own issues, so therefore it's very defensive. Um, one of the things that China, uh, Chinese leaders really um, despise is being isolated um, in, in the, the company of their peers on the world stage. And some of the moves that FG talked about with respect to the, the renminbi's exchange rate were very much, I think, politically motivated to remove the potential focus on the renminbi as a, uh, as a primary issue at G20. So the idea was to uh, effectively take back, you know, pay, some, pay something forward on the renminbi um, and so forth. They're, take the focus off them, take the pressure off them, and then very much throw it back at the Europeans on the, on the debt crisis. And I think um, in large part that, that has succeeded. Yes, I think as FG says, there has been, been, been some sort of reading of the tea leaves and sort of parsing through the comments over the weekend from the People's Bank of China um, and questioning, well, that's what you've said all along. What's new here? There was a bit of a bump uh, on Monday um, in terms of the, the, the of appreciation, a little bit of a clawback as, as uh, I think very clearly the Chinese government is trying to prevent um, a whole lot of hot money speculation from flooding the marketplace. Um, but I, I do think that if you read all of the comments that have been going on in China that there is some sincere desire to, and, and an intent to, um, to move the renminbi. Uh, pretty clearly there's a lot of discussion internally um, in the media in China that this is the right time that to, to begin to move the, uh, the renminbi, that, they, that, that a lot of focus on what happened over the period of time when the renminbi was appreciating before mid-2007 and the suggestion that, A, exports weren't, weren't hurt, you know, our current account surplus continued to go up, so therefore the notion that, com that Chinese competitiveness is, is being hurt by renminbi appreciation is wrong. There are a lot of benefits to do it. Uh, to, to doing it. So I, I, think there, I think there is some sincere intention to move it, and I think you will see a modest blip in, 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 in movement over the, the course of the next, uh, next six, to six months to a year um, on the order of 5 percent, perhaps. Uh, but uh, is that the question is, is not, you know, at, at for, for the G20 is whether to completely remove the pressure on China to move the renminbi. Um, uh, by virtue of what they said over last weekend, and I think uh, if you've said, seen some comments by Prime Minister Harper and others coming out of the U.S., uh, whether it's legisl our legislative branch or otherwise, there's still a lot of intention to, to say, well, you know, we're going to keep watching you. We're going to keep focusing on this issue. We really think the RENB has to, has to move. So uh, it hasn't been completely taken off the table for G20, although I think in, in – in large part, it, the Chinese have been effective in, in, saying, in saying, in saying, hey, we've, we already said we're going to move. Look, we're moving. Here's what we're doing. We've got some concrete stuff going on. So I, I think they, they can, they can um, defend their interests there. Um, more broadly, I think what is, what is China looking to achieve at G20? Um, uh, I, I, I think they're, they're not interested at all in things like a bank levy, not particularly interested at all in um, – in some of the other uh, nitty-gritty financial regulatory reforms that are at the, at the t on the table. There is no consensus. I think, um, by and large, they, they approach this looking at trying to figure out a way to protect their assets in the dollar um, and, at the same time, trying to, uh, to defang any efforts that might be out there uh, to, um, to rebalance the economy in ways that, that limit their flexibility. So um, they go into this, um, looking at this as a as a a, um, a political exercise, an exercise in international politics, and um, given the lack of co cons cohesion and consensus in G20, I think this will be very easy for them to remove, uh, reduce any any um, any challenges to their interests that that, that <coughs> might, might come up. So I'll stop there. Colleague Lisa Cardi, who is the deputy director of our Global Health Project, and many of you know about. Lisa's work on our Smart Global Health Commission. Uh, you can find all of that at smartglobalhealth.org. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Lisa Carter. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, Andrew, and, and thanks to all of you for being here this morning. Um, one thing I've learned is that when you go last, it's best to be really brief. Um, so I'm just going to make three very short points of things I think it might be useful for you all to be attentive to over the coming week and then make sure there's plenty of time for questions for the full panel. Um, so I think the first point I'd make is that you know, I think we're very fond of saying this is really a critical moment for, and then sort of name your issue. Um, but I think in the case of the G8, the G20, and development, this is actually really true this time around. Um, 
We're five years out from the very important commitments made at Glen Eagles. Those commitments were to increase by $50 billion by now, by 2010, um, the general pot for development and health. Um, and it's been a bit of a mixed bag in terms of performance. We're 60% of the way there, um, largely due to US and UK leadership, but we're 40% away from that goal. And Heather mentioned Italy, which has certainly, I think, been a disappointment for many in the, the advocacy community. Um, so there's a lot that remains to be done to still meet the commitments ma made at Glen Eagles. And we're five years out from the Millennium Development Goals Summit, which is supposed to be in 2015. Now that's important in the social and development community because there are a list of eight targets that were set for achieving greater equity and reducing poverty in the developing world, and about four of them are related to health. Um, again, it's a, it's a very mixed story. There's been phenomenal progress made in getting life-saving AIDS treatments to people on the ground. We went from 400,000 people getting access to treatment about eight years ago to four million people having access today. I mean, there's still a deficit of 10 million people that need treatment, but by any measure, that, that's very good progress. Um, there's not been as good progress in maternal and child health, and I'll come back to that in a minute, and that's an area where the Canadians are very much stepping up to the plate. But I think by any measure, the, um, the G8 has really played a very important role in bringing added focus and attention, particularly to the health issues. I mean, simply the fact that at this type of a briefing, I'm sitting here talking about global health and you're taking notes is, in my view, quite amazing because I've been in this field for almost 25 years and I could not have imagined that happening even 15 years ago. Um, so both in terms of providing political leadership in terms of providing resources. I mean, tremendous amounts of money have been mobilized to create things like the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria, which has saved almost five million lives over the last eight years, to launch the um, Global Food Security Initiative in Italy last summer, although there's still some question around how those resources are coming forward, and to really push forward with the program to uh, eradicate Poli to eradicate polio around the world. These have all been important G8 initiatives that have been sustained by the G8. Um, so as, as I look forward to this transition between the G8 and the G20, I think it's going to be very complicated for all the reasons that my colleagues um, have outlined. And I do really think at least over the next five years, between now and 2015 and the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals, it's really going to be important for the G8 to continue to step up to the plate in the way it has in the past. Um, the second area where there's really an important opportunity over the next five years um, and at this G8 summit is in the area of maternal and child health. Um, the statistics here are incredibly bleak. Um, more than 8 million children die every year from largely preventable causes. That's 1,000 kids every hour dying, which I actually had to do the math last night to make sure that was right because when I looked at that figure, I thought that simply can't be true, 1,000 kids an hour, but it, but it is. Um, the story for mothers is, is not much better. Between 350,000 and 500,000 mothers dying every year. Um, Again, one way to think about that is if you're a mother giving birth in the developing world, your risk of dying is one in seven. If you're a mother giving birth in a northern European country, your risk of dying is one in 30,000. So again, an incredibly stark difference here um, that the global community now is focused on in a different kind of way, which is certainly a very good and powerful thing. Um, the US Global Health Initiative is very much focused on maternal child health issues. The Gates Foundation has just announced a new $1.5 billion program in this area. And most importantly for the G8 is, as Heather has mentioned, that Canadians are putting on the table a billion dollar initiative um, on this set of issues, the details of which are very unclear still at this point. But they're challenging others to come forward as well. Um, I think the UK has said it's going to put about a billion dollars on the table. I think France has said it's going to step up in some way. Um, not a lot of clarity from some of the other G8 participants, um, which has actually led the Canadians to do something interesting. They've gone out and invited some of the traditional donor leaders on maternal and child health, specifically New Zealand and Norway, to come to the summit later this week and help get this issue more on the table. Um, so I think it's going to be very important to look at how concretely this moves forward and how successfully the Canadians can really leverage engagement and money from others. Again, you know, this is an issue where political leadership is imperative, where money is needed, but what is really needed is an organizational drive and focus and a sustained view, because these are problems that require five to 10 to 15 year solutions to actually drive forward progress in this area. 
And it's not a question of not knowing what to do. The health community knows what to do. Um, and it's relatively affordable, um, but it's a question of getting organized and having the focus to, to really see it through. So my second point of something to watch is really do keep an eye on this set of maternal child health and broader health issues, and, and particularly look for it, sort of the follow through on the commitments. Um, the third point I'd make is around the accountability report. Um, the G8 for quite some time now has been saying it needs to keep better track of its own commitments and how it's followed through on those commitments. And many people in the civil society, the NGO world, the, the street have been making that same point. So this year for the first time there actually has been an accountability report developed that I think looks back on the last five years of G8 commitments. It was released on Sunday evening. Um, uh, different people are going to see it different ways. I mean there's going to be folks who are going to say can governments really truthfully you know, evaluate their own performance, and I think that's a fair enough point. Um, I've looked at parts of that report, and actually on some issues there's surprising convergence between how the governments rate themselves and how the street would, would rate those governments, and on other issues there's a difference. Um, but I think the thing that struck me when I read at least the health part of the report is it's, um, it doesn't look forward. And I think the important question now is how do you take something like an accountability report, and it doesn't just look at health, it looks at GA commitments across the board, peace and security and food and development, but I think the question is what's the plan forward? You know, you've taken this important first step of rating yourself and looking at your achievements, but now what are you going to do to address the gaps? Um, so those are the three things I suggest that people look forward to in the next week. Thanks. Yeah, uh, George Condon with uh, Congress Daily. Uh, two questions. Last year we sat here and st said the leaders had a lot of questions about President Obama's leadership. Uh, have they reached conclusions about his leadership? And secondly, uh, can you talk about what role trade will play on the agenda? Will there be a pr any pressure on President Obama to do more than just talk about free trade? Well, it, it certainly uh, has been, um, you know, looking now almost 18 months into the Obama administration, uh, the European leaders have sort of settled in and settled down, I would, I would suggest. Uh, last summer, uh, they were all uh, trying to get their Oval Office meetings. They were trying to get lots of uh, photo ops, whether that was at the London summit in April or, or, or throughout uh, the, the G8. So I think they now have a working pattern um, with the president. Uh, clearly, um, I, I think there's still some room to develop that personal relationship, but I think the, the leaders have established a very workmanlike approach. I think you're seeing a lot of transatlantic phone calls. Some of those uh, a few weeks back, it was President Obama urging Chancellor Merkel to uh, sign on to the trillion dollar aid package. Um, in other times, it, you know, it's obviously conferring uh, about an issue. So they've established their rhythm. Um, but I, I point to uh, a line uh, in the recently released national security strategy uh, that I'd like to see the administration flesh out a little bit more, and that's how they cultivate relationships with allies. Um, in, in this uh, period of, of, of great test, whether it's Afghanistan, managing the global economic crisis, um, how do you cultivate your traditional allies? And in part, that's about the G8. How are you cultivating this group of like-minded countries to further an agenda? And I think that's where perhaps the administration could flesh out more. Uh, but I think it has developed its, its rhythm. Um, the leaders are comfortable. Obviously, Prime Minister Cameron is sort of the last of the, the European leaders to, to establish that under great stress and duress, obviously, because of BP. Uh, so that will be the most fragile relationship to, de to develop uh, in the coming weeks. But I think for Sarkozy, Merkel, uh, Berlusconi, the other major European leaders, they feel more confident in their, in their relationship with, with President Obama. I'll let you take trade. Sure. Charles, you um, yeah, it's a great question, um, uh, and it, if you look at the agenda for uh, that, that's been that's been shared around, the trade is really notable in its absence. Um, I think part partially that's because uh, members of the G20, um, the Europeans, the the Asians, and and the, and the Latins can can look at the calendar and realize that November 2010 is just around the corner, and that the the ability the the likelihood that the president is going to move any kind of trade. Uh, liberaliza liberalization, liberalization agenda forward is is slim and none. So uh, pushing that agenda too hard is 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 probably going to 
yield no results at all. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I have no doubt that there will be, um, again, a recommitment to the concept of free trade and perhaps even uh, another tired saw sort of trying to breathe life into the Doha round. Um, uh, it, it, that stuff is going to ring pretty hollow, to be honest with you. And I think it's going to be, um, if, if I'm, if I'm uh, you know, Korea at the table and I hear the, the president talking about trade, I, I kind of scratch my head and say, okay, well, uh, how about it? Uh, so I, I think trade is, is going to be um, is going to be a sore point, and um, uh, you know I, I have no doubt that there will be be some snarky remarks at the table, but they probably won't won't end up in any any concrete document. Um, just a, a note on on kind of a, the, the president's leadership. I think with respect to, to 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 China, there there was a period remember over the last 18 months where we had a real dip in U.S.-China relations, and and then. I think the Chinese and we sort of realized, well, we can't really afford to let this relationship go sour. So uh, I think although the Chinese really viewed the president as relatively weak during his first, first year, and there have been comments in, uh, among Chinese leadership apparently sort of calling him professorial in his approach, uh, I think there's a recognition, again, that you know, this guy is, after all, the leader of the most powerful country on earth, and, and uh, we, we, you know, being overly critical or, or sensing ex more weakness than, than probably is there is probably not to our benefit. If, um, if I may add a couple of things. One is uh, trade, while not specifically mentioned, is one of the key issues when they talk about sustained and balanced economic growth to deal with the deficit of some countries and the surplus. That's basically trade. Uh, they're not putting it in terms of trade to so make it sensitive. But they did signal, um, the G20, that there was substantial consensus on the importance of maintaining open markets. So that is also very positive. It basically says, you know, we're not going to have, uh, we're not going to increase non-tariff barriers, we're not going to change barriers. So at least the, the, the statements are okay. Uh, the implementation of it, as Charles said, is going to probably get delayed a little bit. And with regard to Obama, I actually think that he is going to go to the thing being relatively successful. Um, the economy is turning around. Uh, TARP money is being paid, financial regulatory is being put in place. Um, I mean, we'll talk about the, the Gulf, but other than that, uh, compared to last year, Obama is going to be perceived as have being, uh, have done a pretty good job. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, the, the signal that I got in reading the, the press readout of the of President Obama's call with Merkel sort of suggests that, well, we're going to differentiate uh, those exit strategies. And I think you'll, you'll, they'll come up with artful terms uh, to suggest that we're continuing uh, to work on these issues. We haven't reached agreement. I think back in se September in the, the Pittsburgh G20 summit, I mean, there was a feeling that, okay, corner is being turned, that this summit uh, uh, in, in, in Toronto would be a point where the leaders could say, we, we've managed through the worst part of the storm. Still lots of cleanup to do, but we've made it. And I think with the European debt crisis, with the concern echoed by some that this could cause sort of a double dip recession, unclear where European growth rates are going, that this is not the summit to, to quite say, okay, we've weathered the storm. It's to say, um, we're, we're coming out of this in different places. We need to keep up the, uh, the, the progress. And I think you're going to see the agenda developing really for uh, the summit uh, in, in South Korea in November to see if we really have weathered this European debt crisis. And I think the, the link here, and, and obviously what I've read uh, about the, the Chinese government's concern about the European debt crisis and their ability you know, to, 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 to dampen uh, ec purchase of, of, of ex Sports, this does have these this global ramifications. If Spain uh, continues to have challenges in July, they, they'll, they'll have a big turnover of debt. If that continues to be a problem, that affects U.S. markets. So you're still seeing where uh, these ripples in the pond, if you will, are still affecting them. We're not through it yet. So uh, it's going to be a very important challenge. I watch sort of 
and I know this is not the, the politically correct term, but I don't know what else to call it, sort of these, these pre-G20 caucuses, if you will, to try to manage this agenda, whether it's the BRIC countries conferring, whether it's the G8 countries conferring, where it's others, they're trying to manage an unruly G20 to, to, to make sure they can manage these issues. And, and in some cases, the management is trying to prevent something from happening, uh, like the bank levy and things like that. So you really have a, a dynamism here that uh, it, it's been a challenging from an analytical perspective to, to watch. Go sure. For it. <laughs> sure. Uh, um, th the question is, who's going to be disadvantaged? And if the European banks are in trouble and we're paying for their trouble, uh, why should our bank be disadvantaged because of their mistake? Without the bank levy, the European banks have to handle what's going on, but we already are, are in the clear. So our banks will be you know, relatively in better shape. That's the same feeling as the Canadian banks. It's the same thing as the the Japanese. And, and this is some of the concern that some of the European ideas, they're, they're almost in a point sort of going unilateral a bit. Um, uh, some of the recent German actions, if you don't manage this carefully and coordinate it, you're going to cause new problems and, and uh, the global financial transactions, whether you, you're going to manage you know, deri derivatives and hedge funds, well, how does that disadvantage American investment and capital? So this has to be coordinated, but you don't have a, a coordinated position yet. So it's, it's a very challenging moment. And it's unintended con consequences right. that may occur, which is exactly what Heather said. Thank you. Uh, Jim from the Straits Times, a question for Charles. Um, you know, the, the Chinese moves on the, the UN issue, do you think that's enough to satisfy Congress and the White House? And going into this um, G20 meeting, you know, what sort of um, stance do you think Obama's going to, to bring on, to bear on, on the UN issue at the meetings? Well, I, I think the President will continue to say, um, you know, it's very, this is a very important issue and we, we are watching very closely. Um, will it stave off congressional legislation while well, Chuck Schumer is still still calling for for um, a vote soon? Um, I think in general it probably takes all the wind out of the sails of, of legislation over the next next little bit because you will see some movement and, and as legislators watch that happen, um, they're, they're going to say, why are we doing this again? Um, certainly I mean, it, it, it probably takes it out takes any any chance that legislation will pass through the House. Um, completely off the table. Um, if I'm Treasury, um, I wait until the congressional recess and issue the report with, um, <laughs> and um, and and talk a lot about sort of the technical aspects of what defines manipulation and say, according to the technical aspects, China is not a manipulator uh, because there's another street that's paying very close attention to that, and that's Wall Street. And I, I think a signal that, that Treasury and, and is, is going down the direction of, of entering into something, something like a currency war is it would not be good news for those of us that want to avoid a double, double dip. For anyone who, who can answer it, some in the administration have suggested that the Europe, European countries think that the fact that the financial regulation bill has gotten so far in Congress, it's tantamount to having passed. Is, is this the case? I mean, is, is this, this, this bill is obviously not going to come out before the G8 and the G20. So what is the attitude going to be in, in Toronto towards what our Congress is doing and whether, in fact, Obama has this, you know, has this locked up at this point? Well, I, I think the Europeans have been educated uh, over the last year and a half, particularly, about how the Ad Obama administration manages their legislative agenda. And I think they were given a very important lesson on how long health care took. And again, as I was telling you last year, you know, th this was when the Obama administration was, uh, you know, meeting all the, the, the new leaders, and they were coming to Washington to visit with the president, and they were hearing, 
where the process was on health care reform, but you know, the, German, the, the Germans want to talk about climate change. They want to know about where is this legislative process. So I think the Europeans have been educated, if you will, uh, in, in the challenges of moving complex, difficult legislation through the, the process. It, it, last fall in Pittsburgh, the Europeans were expressing concern that uh, a year after uh, the September 2008 collapse, there was still no package that was passed that again wanting to capture the urgency uh, you know now as we're sort of heading towards the second anniversary uh, of Lehman Brothers you know again we need the urgency we need the focus we don't want this global economic crisis to to happen again but on the other side the the Europeans themselves have had a very difficult time developing uh, EU-wide regulation. I mean, there's not a, uh, there's endless ideas on, you know, creating a ratings agency, more supervising, and they're, they're creating these things, but they haven't reached consensus themselves. So I would suggest that while they may point to the U.S. Congress and say, you know, why haven't you, you know, almost two years after uh, when the world stood still, you haven't done anything, uh, Europe has, it's, you know, hasn't quite come out with all of its uh, regulatory requirements either. And, and uh, just to add to that, that's why they're unilaterally making decisions. I think they, they basically thought that things are not going to happen very quickly. We need to do something. Uh, we may not like what the something is. In, in fact, we don't like what the somethings are. But, but they've unilaterally decided to take some steps. Well, the, the paradox is that there's more European representation around the G20 table, yet can they find their voice? Can they influence the agenda? And I would suggest it, there's, uh, they're going to have a difficult time uh, getting the European economic agenda past the G8, not even to the G20 yet. So first steps first. Um, you know, this is sort of a, a longer, broader, more uh, theological, I think, uh, is point and where we are in transitioning from, you know, the post-World War II structures uh, that were, you know, dominated by European and American perspectives. And as I said, the G5 in 1975 is the perfect example where, you know, five countries were gathered in, in, in Rambouillet to, to have a talk about how this is all going to work. Well, the conversation in, in 2008 to 2010 has to include 20 countries, some uh, having a, a dynamism to their policies and their perspective, and others are trying to, uh, to renew and reinvigorate their growth strategies. So, we're just in a different paradigm. The problem is we, uh, we are still holding on to the old uh, because that's what we know and that's the, the vehicle we choose. We haven't quite created the new structures to feel comfortable and completely moving over. So we are going to be in this period of time, I would argue for the next five to 10 years, of this very messy, ambiguous transition period where you're going to have some freelancing, uh, some ad hoc coalitions that are created around interest-based agendas. And what makes Europe really uncomfortable about this is that it, we're moving from a value-based paradigm of those like-minded countries and we're shifting much more to an, an interest-based agenda where um, the, the rules of the road aren't going to be as clear as we'd like. And that's what has Europe feeling very uncomfortable. And when you're in a situation where you feel like you have no control, 
and I think this is again some of the European reaction to the you know the, the view of the market speculation and this is out of control. You either grab onto it and by God you're going to control it and you're going to be unilateral and you're going to put your stamp on it, or you're going to let your hands go and say I'm I'm going for a ride on this roller coaster. I'll and I'll do my best to stay in the you know in the car and not fall out when we do the loop de loop, and that's where I think they feel. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable for everyone. We're in this transitional period for what's been working for us for 60 odd years isn't working anymore. May I add oh, a sorry. couple of things? Um, it, it's interesting that you, you, you mentioned it in that way because I think many of the Americans feel that their role is diminished as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the European, it, it's an America. It's basically the old guard as opposed to the rising. Um, the difference between, uh, from an outsider looking in, the difference between Europe and the U.S. is the U.S. likes to see the G20 be board of directors of the global economy. I've said that before. Um, while the Europeans, maybe not the administration, but the Europeans want to see the committee to save the world. Now, the committee to save the world needs a lot of money. And unfortunately, where is that money going to come from? So that's kind of the dilemma. So I, I see both. North America and Europe role diminishing, but their role based on the desire of the people is quite different also. Yeah, I, the last two weeks I've uh, probably had more uh, public outreach on the so-called U.S.-U.K. special relationship. It's not so special. What does this all mean? And it's uh, uh, it's been a it's been a very difficult uh, conversation to to, to have uh, as such close allies. Uh, as I said, you never want to start a new relationship and creating this. Uh, hopefully a good personal relationship between David Cameron and, and Barack Obama, the last thing you want to do is in the, 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 the highest stress environment where both the you know, public opinion on both sides are demanding a specific response by their leaders, and it's a very populist response. It's not necessarily uh, seeking uh, solutions to the actual problem. Um, so I think that the photo op here will be the handshake between uh, Prime Minister Cameron uh, and, and President Obama, um, and uh, how both leaders, uh, what their public statements will be on on the oil spill. Uh, as I said, this is a this is a mutual interdependence in the 21st century. Uh, Forty percent of BP shareholders are Americans. Six Americans sit on their board of directors. Uh, and, and British pension funds and tax revenues are very dependent on BP being successful. So we are very mutually dependent economically on this subject, uh, and clearly uh, BP must find a, a solution uh, to, to, the, to the oil spill. Um, but we can't lose the side of the broader relationship, and I'll get back to Afghanistan and, and the story that unfolds uh, regarding General McChrystal. Um, we have all, you know, General McChrystal also reports to NATO. He reports to the Secretary General. He is dual-hatted. He's in charge of the coalition. Now, granted, that coalition is predominantly of, of, of U.S. forces, but uh, this issue uh, is becoming, will become, I think, a major challenge to David Cameron to manage. That's why he uh, went very quickly to Afghanistan to confer with his commanders. Uh, the uh, d command changes uh, in Helmand from a British command to U.S. command. That's been a bit of conversation. They're suffering casualties and obviously will continue as the offensive con uh, begins in Kandahar. This is uh, an ally we need to remain strong, and so we ha have to keep BP in, in, in perspective as much as it's very difficult when you see these horrific pictures 
um, coming out. Uh, finally, on the oil spill, uh, President Medvedev has made a suggestion that we need a global oil fund uh, to prevent, you know, to sort of create uh, ways for uh, cleanup, ecological cleanup. I don't know whether he will uh, introduce that bilaterally with President uh, Obama at the White House or, or do that in the uh, G8 uh, setting. Uh, but you will see, obviously, the, uh, the, the spillover effect of this, uh, whether that's Arctic oil and gas exploration for the, for the Russia. Uh, and, and future drilling, I mean, this has got uh, everyone focused on what the implications are of this, uh, both the spill as well as the environmental consequences. Yeah, sorry if in my um, effort to be brief and concise I overlooked some of the, the finer points here. Um, but, you know, I think to your first point of the role of the WHO, and I, I think to the colleague's point here as well, you know, I, I think um, this area of cooperation around global health is a bit of a bright spot in terms of um, sort of multilateral collaboration. And I think it is an area where the U.S. has tried to engage strongly with European partners, um, I think in part because the U.S. realizes it alone cannot be the solution. Um, and I think there's also just a necessity to do that if these issues are actually going to be addressed over a 10- or 20-year horizon, which is the time frame, actually, um, that, that's required. In terms of your question on structure and, and WHO, is yeah, yeah, it mm. Right. I don't think it's competing, but I think it is a fair question of um, how effectively the, the governance structure for some of these big health initiatives has emerged and evolved over time. Because many of them are focused on single diseases, which has yielded great results. For example, I mentioned some of them in the area of HR, HIV AIDS. Um, but what they've done is also sort of silo the health systems. So that while you know people might be surviving HIV better, they're still dying of TB. Um, so I think there's a recognition that this is kind of the next tier of challenge that people need to go to now, and that it is absolutely essential that the WHO be a part of those discussions and that there be a forum, and maybe it's in the G8 or maybe it's in addition to the G8, where the, the check writers and the check receivers and organizations like WHO and this Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria actually have a forum to have a joint plan and a joint platform for how to attack the problem. Secretary General actually is convening in... New York and I think October, a summit on maternal and child health to get at some of these coordination issues. But they're very difficult. Um, in some ways, for all the same reasons, coordination within the G20 might be difficult. There's just lots of different interests that need to be met. Um, and to your point about Haiti, I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. We can try to check on it for you. I think we'll have to get back to you on that one. <laughs> I'm sorry? Sorry. 
really, that's, that's sort of the next step G20 countries have to decide if they want a more formal, transparent mechanism. And, and I, this is part of the, uh, the migration of the agendas, if that's what the G20 countries want to do and start dealing with this in a more, uh, you know, transparent, regular process. I mean, we're still sort of deciding the chairmanship and when the summits are being held and, and things like that. But that's a decision for the G20 has to make. And that it will be an important decision because it's part of this, you know, transition period. But uh, they have not made those decisions, to my understanding. Um, but if they're going to take on other issues on the agenda, they're going to need some structure and process to that. And I'll just say, remember, the G G20 was kind of the thing that was at hand during a moment of crisis. So it, it, it's not necessarily the natural board of directors of, of, of um, the global economy, let alone um, the, you know, global social welfare. It, it, it just happened to be, you know, it was the tourniquet that was there when, when, the, when the bleeding was going on. So, um, you know, that I guess the question is, is it, is it going to survive as the de facto and de jure Next thing, um, probably because I don't know that there's a whole lot of interest in 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 sort of creating something completely new. But you sort of look at the G at the G20 membership, and there are a couple of head scratchers there. Um, you know, you want, I love my friends in Buenos Aires, but why are they on, um, on the board of directors of the global economy? It doesn't necessarily make that much sense. Um, so I mean, but you know, so so I think given that there is some question about. The fundamental nature of the G20 as a, as as that de facto club, um, you know, I I, I'm, I think there's going to be a lot of questions in a longer transition period before people say, well, I guess it's time we finally formalize this thing and put together a secretariat, and here's the formal agenda that we all agree on. I think it's just too too early to tell. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, there's a couple ways you can access the transcript to this. One, I will send it to you. Two, um, it'll be up at CSIS.org. Um, there will also be multimedia uh, surrounding this uh, briefing. There will be video and audio and perhaps a highlights reel that will be at CSIS.org and also on our iTunes platform, which is on the Beyond Campus section uh, of Apple's iTunes. Thanks very much for coming.